Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium the Northern California Managing Director of Accenture, Chris DiGiorgio. All right, well, good morning. On behalf of Accenture, I have the distinguished honor of introducing probably the most fun panel of the day, the future of sports in the Bay Area. Accenture is a proud to support the, the work of the Bay Area Council by bringing together business leaders, political officials. The Bay Area Council has given the unique opportunity to come together as a community and discuss how we can mobilize as a region, take full advantage of our strengths. Together, I believe we can create a change in order to achieve high performance. As a global management consulting and outsourcing company, Accenture is delivering to the promise of high performance. We are working with our clients to navigate the challenges of the new business landscape while at the same time bringing together our skills and commitment to support the enthusiasm of the community and local organizations like the Bay Area Council where we work and live. We are starting to see the great results. So on this topic today, there's a great deal of excitement and, and uh, different moving places, pieces going on in the Bay Area sports scene. But one thing is for sure, it's a really a great time to be a fan. Just last Friday, the Giants celebrated their 2010 championship season with their home opener. And after Friday and Saturday's walk-off hits, it looks like it's going to be torture, the sequel. The 49ers consider, continued to move forward with their plans for a new stadium. The Earthquakes just began demolition on their site for a new stadium. College football is more popular than ever in the Bay Area. And against the backdrop of all of that, we have the prestige and flair of the America's Cup coming to our region in 2013, which will bring not just fans, but a new impressive facility to the San Francisco's waterfront. So before we start, let me do some brief introductions to our panelists, and then they'll all come out at the end. First, of course, is Larry Bear, the team president of the San Francisco Giants and a fellow member of the Bay Area Council Executive Committee. One of the leaders and assisted in the ownership of the group that negotiated the 1992 sale, which kept the Giants in San Francisco, and since then has been a key strategist and negotiator for all the team's transactions, which include the signings of Barry Bonds, Tim Lincecum, and more importantly, Gordon Beers for all those garlic fries that we love to have at the game. So I want to thank Larry for joining us today. Gary Cavalli is co-founder and executive director of the Kraft Fight Hunger Bowl, formerly the Emmer Bowl, and the postseason uh, college football game that's played annually at AT&T Park. A veteran of over 30 years in sports management in the Bay Area, Gary is co-founder and CEO of the American Basketball League, a women's professional basketball league, and previously served as a sports information director and associate athletic director at Stanford University. For you Cal fans, that's a small university down on the farm about 30 miles from here. He's also uh, here to explain the BCS, so for you Cal fans, pay attention. Uh, Gary, you have your work cut out for you, and thank you for coming today. David Caval is the president of San Jose Earthquakes, and prior to joining the Earthquakes and starting his career at Accenture, by the way, David founded the Golden Basketball League in 2003, which, which grew to become one of the premier professional minor leagues in, in North, uh, North America. He is also responsible for raising much of the initial capital to launch the league, signing high-profile players such as Ricky Henderson, Jose Canseco, and negotiating the league's multi-million dollar naming rights agreement with Safeway. Thanks for being here, Dave. Craig Thompson is the CEO of the America's Cup Event Authority. After helping to organize the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, Craig moved to Switzerland where he has spent the last 25 years in sports marketing. During that time, he's, he was part of the team that created the UEFA Champions League, a groundbreaking professional European soccer league in which Europe's uh, top teams participate. Craig became CEO of America's Cup in 2010 and will be moving to, this Bay to the San Francisco in this summer of 2011. Thank you for joining us, Craig. Jed York is entering the second season as president and CEO of the San Francisco 49ers. He's hard at work making sure the organization returns to the championship standard set by his uncle, Eddie DeBartolo Jr. In June 2010, Jed spearheaded a successful ballot measure allowing for the construction of a new site, the state of the art, and green football stadium in Santa Clara. Like Larry, Jed is also a fellow member of the executive committee of the Bay Area Council. Thanks for joining us. And as our moderator today is Brian Murphy, probably best known to everyone in the audience as Murph from that uh, show of Murph and Mac on KNBR, the flagship radio station in San Francisco Giants. The San Francisco 49ers and Golden State Warriors, excuse me, uh, prior to joining the KNBR in 2004, Brian was a sports writer for 15 years, covering the 49ers, the A's, the PGA Tour, and most recently with the, uh, the Chronicle. He's also written several books, the most recent of which was on the Giants World Series title, 
entitled Worth the Wait. Make sure you pick up a copy. So with that, let me turn it over to the program over to Murph and say thank you all for coming today. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to what should be a very fun discussion for the great group. Gosh, we, if we could have just taped what we were saying back there, we would have had a good session. <laughs> We've already gone off and chatting. And so what we're going to do is, before we start with a little bit of entertainment, want to let all you high-tech people out there know that we're going to be taking questions via Twitter, and the key thing is that the pound sign is pound BAC Outlook, okay? So you can get firing away. They're all going to take questions. And I know you guys have them, so pound BAC Outlook is the way to go. And without further ado, we don't come without any kind of, we don't come not prepared. So our good friend from America's Cup, Craig Thompson, brought us a little video. So let's start the morning with perhaps a little movie entertainment. Should we call it a movie trailer for a most unique event that's coming our way? America's Cup, the yachting championship of the world, is going to be taking place right here in the Bay in 2013. And I'm sure we're all just going to learn about it together. So let's start with a little video about the future. It was directed by James Cameron, wasn't it? I think we're ready for a high-tech movie here. So, okay, let's, for reintroductions, we know we had a nice introduction, but to make sure everybody knows who everybody is, we start on our left with, can we greet him with a Beat LA chant, everybody? <laughs> Giants president, Larry Bear. We should note that Larry brought the World Series trophy. It's outside in the hallway. And wow, who would have thought? I mean, the World Series trophy, they don't go anywhere with that, right? It's, it's in hiding. Oh my God, it's the most visible thing so. in Northern California. <laughs> to his right is the CEO, well, let's get it right, the CEO and president of the San Francisco 49ers. And as he said to me, hey man, I got nothing but time on my hands <laughs> during the NFL lockout. Jed York, ladies and gentlemen. To his right is a good friend of mine. I love college football. We were discussing my woeful UCLA Bruins backstage. He's the executive director of the Craft Fight Hunger Bowl, Gary Cavalli, ladies and gentlemen. And then because we're going to open with you, Craig, to my two to my right is from the fastest growing sport in America, the beautiful world of football, or as the insiders call it, footy. The president of the San Jose Earthquakes with a very exciting future, David Caval, ladies and gentlemen. And then our new friend who's new to the area at, with a distinguished resume, he spent 11 years building up the monster that is Champions League soccer. And I'm sure if you're a sports fan at this council, you know at least about the legends of Manchester United and Real Madrid and those great legendary clubs. Well, for 11 years, Craig Thompson lived in Switzerland and built the television and global monster that is Champions League. And now he's taking his talents, as LeBron would say, <laughs> to San Francisco to launch the 34th America's Cup. So America's Cup CEO, Craig Thompson, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And we'll start with you, Craig, because the title of this panel is uh, The Future of Sports in the Bay Area. And everybody here, to a certain degree, is a known entity, some more than others, but you're really the unknown entity. And so maybe give us a chance to tell us, first of all, when the America's Cup is. Some people don't even know, mm -hmm. September 2013. And that video you guys had right there, the message you guys are trying to get across as to what the Bay Area can expect. Well, as everybody knows, Larry Ellison won the Cup um, last year. And we're bringing it back to San Francisco for the first time. It's coming back to America after 20 years. We're really, really excited about this. You can see the boats that are going to be raced 
fastest boats ever raced in an America's Cup. It's going to be really exciting, dangerous. Television's going to love it. <laughs> and one of the big things about being here in San Francisco is that we're on the bay, uh, which is a first. You might be surprised, but the America's Cup has always, in its 150-year history, always been sailed out on the ocean. So you have spectator boats out there, but no real fans around, around the race, obviously. Here in San Francisco, we're going to be right in, in the bay, right along Chrissy Field, right along Alcatraz. It's going to be spectacular for hundreds of thousands of people to come out and watch. And the actual race is in, in the summer of 2013, uh, starting in mid-July and running through mid-September. Now, I'm wondering, knowing the bay, I'm trying to picture it, was there any chance you guys can swing by McCovey Cove and give the Giants a look? Is it, would it go that right far by. down the bay, under the we Bay Bridge? Go catch some baseballs. Uh, would it go? Would it go under the Bay Bridge? No. Cetera? What's the course like? The course will. Uh, well, the, the race is provisioned to start near Chrissy Field, go out under the bridge, but not too far, just so we get those great spectacular views, and then coming back and finishing at Pier 27 and 29 in the center of the city there. Wow! And so spectators would literally stand on Chrissy Field like they're walking their dogs and watch this. Everybody's welcome. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, well, we're going to kind of try to spread it around a little bit. And again, Twitter questions welcome at pound BAC Outlook. But because all of us, or a lot of us, sports fans were focused on China Basin this past weekend, we'll turn our attention to Larry Bear, the world champion, Larry Bear. Uh, although I'd like to see them beat Clayton Kershaw one point this year, wouldn't we all? Uh, Larry, I, it's funny that we come here and, and say the future of the Bay Area sports, whereas you guys are very much living in the present of Bay Area sports as world champions. How in, how in the world can you guys use something like this to build your franchise going forward? You know, I mean, we, you know, we all wonder, well, the Giants right now have reached the highest point they can reach, but you guys probably don't see it that way. You guys probably want to somehow use this momentum to build something in the future. No, I think uh, that's right, Brian. I, I would say first off that you know we do strategic objectives at the end of the year, like like many companies, many of you do, November, December, and we have a dozen or so, ten to twelve. And one of the first strategic objectives, quite frankly, was um, stay humble, no crowing, because uh, you know the, the sports industry and all industries are replete with with teams or companies that kind of go like this and come back down. And it's really important, we feel, to carry certain messages with the championship. Uh, it was it, that, and that drove the trophy program uh, over the off season, where we took the trophy and we continue to do so to the fans, because the fans, 90 million fans, have supported the Giants through paid admissions in our 50 years here. And then, if you if you extend it out to people who've watched and bought merchandise and everything else, it's uh, it's way beyond that. So. We want to be. We want to make sure that number one, we understand the fans understand that it's about them. It's not about us beating our chest, and also that we want to we want to extend. We want to create what we like to think is of as a, a powerful brand that is in Northern California and also beyond Northern California. You know, and 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 to do that, we need to uh, you know we need to do certain things. We're doing a show. We, we're talking about behind be, uh, backstage. Uh, there's a, a national show that debuts tomorrow night on the Giants. Uh, we like to think of it as, as more of a documentary or a docudrama, but um, a lot of people don't know the Giants, and a lot of people in Northern California know the Giants, but on the East Coast didn't know the Giants, and we believe taking our message nationally, it's not good, just good for the Giants, but good for baseball. It helps World Series ratings, it helps national uh, visibility for the game if people can get to know our team. Two things I want to follow up on, Larry, before we say good morning to Jed York. One would be, it's pretty funny, if you see Larry and tell him you watch the Showtime show that debuts tomorrow night, don't call it a reality show. As he said, a reality show is the Kardashians. That's not us, that's what he said. I said, come on, Larry. Hopefully so we're a little more functional. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, like the Kardashians, who has the best rear end on the comments, right? Yeah. The other thing, isn't that what she's famous for, right? That's not all bad. Yes. The other thing is, before we say good morning to Jed, is what's on that right hand of yours, Larry? I think you want to hold that up and let it glitter in the sun and the light there. Well, believe it or not, and you know, this, I, I, we should say it's, a, it's a, a player's ring. Some of us in the organization, I guess all of us in the organization, Get to, get to get one, but um, it really, in the 
the design of it, we were mindful that it's about the players. And when you talk to people like Aubrey Huff or people like Pat Burrell, who won one before, you realize that from little league days, from high school days, certainly from minor league days, the players, their focus, I mean, we all focus on things that how do we climb to the pinnacle of our industry or our, our craft, our careers. The pinnacle for them is receiving a ring because it means that they were performing on a championship team. And Jed knows it well, five, <laughs> five times yes. the uh, 49ers have brought that to our community. Uh, and to see in their faces, each of them, when they receive their ring Saturday night, you know, I, I can wear it around and all that, but it's, it's, it's about the players who received it on the field. That was a very, very special um, event Saturday night. And, it's, uh, and, and I think the fans fed into to that feeling, and that's 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 what, it, in many ways, that's what it's all about. Well, uh, just on a personal note, I was sitting in section 108, and for our generation, I'm 43 years old, who grew up without Mays and without Cepeda and without Marichal, our only cling from 71 to 86 until Will Clark and the boys came along was the late years of Willie McCovey. <clears throat> he was the only great player that we got to see, and for him to see, to get that ring was very very emotional, and my hat is off to you guys for doing that. That was a great, great touch. It was beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. For stretch, everybody. For stretch. It, and, and I think we see this in all sports. It's beautiful when you can connect yes. whatever current achievement you may be fortunate enough to, to gain with those who came before. Because, quite frankly, without those who came before, who knows where we would be? Right. Without the Willie Mazes, Willie McCoveys, and Orlando Cepedas, who all received rings with the current team. We could be the Montreal Expos or something like that. <laughs> Instead, they're the Giants. And Larry kind of alluded to it, but I kind of joke, you know, Larry's got his ring and Giants fans are happy for it. The guy to his right says, yeah, I got five of those. That's what it says. <laughs> the 49ers, one of the greatest franchises in all of professional sports and have as many Super Bowl wins. It's only the Steelers now, right, with six, Jed? Yeah, but I need one that I, I win. <laughs> okay, well, first we want to say good morning to Jed York. And we joked about him having time on his hands, but that's one of the things we want to talk about is the future of sports in the Bay Area. Obviously, we're going to ask you about the stadium and its possibilities. But first and foremost, what's the future of the NFL in, in 2011 right now? Well, I think most people, if you're following the, the situation, you saw there was a hearing last week, last Wednesday. Uh, the, the judge suggested very strongly to both sides that they get together and, and work this out on their own, which I think the NFL has been trying to do since the beginning. We've wanted to negotiate this. We didn't want to go to court. And that's, that's really where we are right now. We, we want to make sure that we can no negotiate a deal that, that works for the players, it works for the owners, but most importantly, works for the fans. And we're getting to a point now where y you can't just keep raising ticket prices to, to satisfy players and owners' needs. You, you have to be able to work together. It, it's all three of those groups need to be satisfied and more than satisfied. They need to be happy and, and, and excited for, for this game to continue to be great and continue to grow. There's a sense among the players that they said, we had a collective bargaining agreement. I'm, I think most of you, if you're here, are aware of what's going on. But if not, there was a collective bargaining agreement between the players and the, and the owners that the owners opted out of voluntarily. So the players said, wait a minute, we're, uh, the league is thriving. The revenues are, are enormous. So why would the owners opt out of this? And so a lot of people have sided sort of with the players on this saying, well, at least I'm representing the player's side of you by saying, well, why would the owners opt out of this if, if the league is thriving? Well, again, it's got to be something that works for all three of those parties. You know, you, you can't just continue to raise revenues the, the way that we've raised revenues. You can't just cut costs to make your bottom line. The, the only team that you can kind of talk about that has public figures is, is the Green Bay Packers. When, when you see the Green Bay Packers, when you see what their profit margins have done since the collective bargaining agreement, you know, the new collective bargaining agreement came into place, you see what's happened. And I think that's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to a more fair way of sharing and a better way to increase revenues that, that doesn't put the burden on the fans. And that's sort of where we are right now. And I think all of professional sports are in, in a similar situation where you can't just raise ticket prices when, when you need to meet something. You have to continue to grow your brand. You look at what Larry's doing with taking the Giants, you know, national and international. That might not generate revenue for you today, but it's going to enhance the Major League Baseball brand and it's going to enhance the Giants brand so you have a stronger business down the road 
that, that all the fans can use, all the fans can share. And you, you look at a company like Twitter that's helping us today. You know, there's a way to reach out to new media, new technology, but that takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of investment to make sure that you can monetize those things and not defray the cost on your fan, but, but use newer technologies that can continue to, continue to grow the game for everybody. And again, Jed mentioned Twitter, and if you guys are out there and you want questions, because you guys will be a huge part of this, uh, and we'll take them very soon. If you have a question, throw it out on Twitter with the hashtag BAC Outlook. One more for you, Jed, real quick, and we'll say hi to the rest of the panel here. It's how would any potential new collective bargaining agreement directly affect the building of a new 49er stadium in Santa Clara? Is the future of that stadium, which you've targeted for 2015, linked to a new collective bargaining agreement, meaning you could get some sort of revenue out of that that would help build that stadium faster or better? So it, it would obviously help from a, a financing standpoint. It, it helps when you go to a bank and you actually have a business that's <laughs> generating revenue as opposed to not playing football. Uh, but we, we moved our start date from 14 to 15, sort of anticipating some type of work stoppage. And that's really what the new collective bargaining agreement will allow us to do. It will allow us to unlock the NFL stadium funds, and it will obviously help when you're talking to, to bankers about moving forward and financing the stadium. So as a result, would a delay into the fall of 2011, which some people are anticipating, that's a six-month delay from now, would have an, maybe an effect where you might have to look at 2016? No. Uh, w I mean, we're looking at starting our construction in January of 2013, so we've got some time, and I'm very confident that we're going to have a, a, an NFL season at okay. some point. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the summer plays out. We mentioned college football in the introductions, and Gary Cavalli runs the uh, Craft Fight Hunger Bowl. Ten years now, Gary, ten years. It used to be called the Emerald Bowl, and now it's the Craft Fight Hunger Bowl. And it's interesting is you're linked to the man two to your left because you use the Giants Stadium to play football. So first of all, welcome. And second of all, let's talk about college football and, and the success or the challenges of playing in that stadium. Now, is the Craft Fight Hunger Bowl here to stay? It's a new sponsor. You know, college football fans are wondering, will it be around, or does this mean this is something that is short-term? What is the, the short-term and long-term prognosis of the health of, the, of a college football bowl game here in San Francisco? Well, thank you, Brian. I think a lot of people thought we were nuts when we started a bowl game in San Francisco. Uh, uh, you know, San Francisco is a long way from Norman, Oklahoma, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, you know, places that are known as, you know, hotbeds of college football. And, you know, we're in the same market with all these gentlemen up here, you know, the Giants, the A's, the 49ers, the Raiders, the Earthquakes, the Sharks, the Warriors, the list goes on and on. So I think when we started the game, a lot of people thought we were nuts. And uh, uh, we had a lot of nuts in our history. The game started as the Diamond <laughs> Walnut San Francisco Bowl. Uh, and our next sponsor was the uh, Emerald Nuts Company. So we've had a lot of nuts in our history. <coughs> but I think thanks to the work of a lot of people um, and some good matchups, we've been able to build the game. Our, uh, uh, this year was our fourth sellout in the last five years. Uh, we've been one of the highest rated games on television every year for the last five years and a lot of the credit goes to uh, the people that got it started. Uh, John Marks at the convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, Mayor Brown was a, a big advocate of the game when we got it off the ground. Uh, we've got a tremendous board of directors, some of whom are here today, Herb Meyer as I know is here and Jerry Simmons, but the matchup is the key. I think once we got the Pac-10, uh, the game really took off. Uh, we had UCLA, Florida State, your alma mater. Lost. Uh, someday to be my daughter's alma mater. Uh, we had uh, Cal Miami. So we've had some really good matchups. And then right from the get-go, we've had the backing of the Giants. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here, the game wouldn't be here uh, without the San Francisco Giants. Um, they backed the game financially. They helped us get off the ground. Uh, I think playing in that ballpark, there's a certain panache to it. There's a certain mystique to it. And again, a lot of people say, geez, a football game in a baseball stadium, how can you do that? Well, guess what? A lot of people are now copying us. Uh, the New York Yankees um, are hosting a bowl game called the Pinstripe Bowl. Uh, there was a college game at uh, Wrigley Field this year. So we kind of feel like we were pioneers. And I think the uh, allure of, uh, of the Giants in the stadium has definitely been a factor in our success. To talk about the future, uh, we do have a new sponsor, Kraft Foods, the second biggest food company in the world. Uh, deep pockets, uh, tremendous promotion of the game this year, tremendous presence throughout San Francisco. Uh, they gave out 300,000 samples this year, uh, everything from mac and cheese to Oreos to, uh, to Ritz crackers, and uh, we've got them for three or four years. Okay. Um, and um, as I mentioned to you when we talked about the panel today, they've tied us into a national initiative. You know, we're fighting hunger in the United States, and um, this year Kraft generated 20 million meals for Feeding America, which is a, 
a consortium of 200 uh, food banks throughout the United States, including the San Francisco Food Bank. And then we, we wanted to do something tangible here in San Francisco, so we donated a meal uh, for every ticket sold to the game, to the food bank, to Glide, and to St. Anthony's. Okay, well, it sounds great. Hey, just thought popped into my head with Jed hopefully building a new stadium. Would uh, you think at all perhaps about, you know, thinking moving a venue? Or would Jed, would you guys be open to hosting a college football bowl game in a new stadium? Maybe an extra bowl game, for example. Well, I don't want to steal a bowl game from there. I know, we can start a little war here. <laughs> yes, I, I think leverage, right? One of the things that we've talked about is, is potentially hoping a Pac-10 championship game, oh. which I think would be great. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as you, well, sorry, Pac-12, as, as we get to the Pac-12. <laughs> That's right. So I, I think there's, there's a lot more football that can be played in, in Northern California. And Larry, you guys, when you built that stadium, you know, it was baseball only, but you've hosted, what, motocross and, well, ski I saw jumping. Paul McCartney there. And, ski uh, jumping. <laughs> ski jumping, that's right, Johnny Mosley's thing, right? The, uh, you know, for us, um, it doesn't, when we don't have baseball, and Gary's uh, game was really one of, the, one of the, obviously one of the first marquee events. When we don't have baseball, we don't see the benefit of letting, letting the ballpark, you know, uh, go idle and be, and be, uh, and just sit there. So. We do about 120 non-baseball events a year. Some of them are smaller corporate events. We have a, a company uh, that does a big event with a, with a uh, uh, with an A-level talent, big concert that's just for their their guests uh, every year. So it's uh, for us, it's really part of the business we're in. We're in the business of creating entertainment and attractions. It's a, a division within the Giants called Giants Enterprises. So. Uh, the partnership with Gary has been a, a huge factor that in that. Okay, turning to our right here, uh, we have not yet heard from our gentleman from the earthquakes, David Caval. And the earthquakes are an interesting story. First of all, you know, if you're a true sports fan, soccer, you have to appreciate a lot of people in America don't sort of quote unquote get soccer, right? Uh, to, we have people call into our show, you know, oh, one to nothing, zero to zero. <laughs> That's not what soccer's about. It's, it's what the Brazilians call the beautiful game, it right? Is, yes. And, uh, and for if you follow it in its nuances, and it's, it's star-driven, these great, brilliant European players. And what America did in the World Cup was exciting, and Landon Donovan, and there's young players coming up. So to me, of all the people up here, you guys have the, you know, America's Cup is a very old and history tradition event. You guys have the brightest, you know, biggest and brightest future ahead of you. Um, and what's also interesting is, I don't know if our, many of our people here know, is that how affiliated you guys are with the Oakland A's. Mm -hmm. Correct? So why don't you speak a little bit about kind of the vision of the earthquakes going forward. How big do you think it can get here in the Bay Area? And how involved are the Oakland A's? What is that link between the A's and the earthquakes? And then one more for you. Okay. How that link between the A's and the earthquakes plays into a potential move of the A's to San Jose where the earthquakes are. It's a lot for you there. It's a lot. Don't no, <laughs> worry. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, on the quakes, you know, obviously, um, for us, we think our future is very bright here in the Bay Area. You know, we've been around in many um, incarnations all the way from 1974 with the NASL. We had players like Johnny Moore and George Best, who also played for Manchester United, play for the quakes over the years. And obviously, San Jose was one of the charter members of Major League Soccer in 1996 when the clash came. Um, so there's a long history of soccer in San Jose, and actually there was just a report done, and actually the Oregonian paper did it in Portland to prove that the city of Portland was Soccer City USA, because it's like on their little, you know, you know, traffic sign when you walk when you go into their city. But they ran all the numbers, and actually San Jose won hmm. because there was more people playing soccer, there was more history of soccer with the NASL and the earthquakes, and so I think that's a very important statistic and note to, for people to understand that. You know, already there's a lot of interest in soccer here. You know, we already, you know, we have a 10,000 seat stadium. We average 9,000 fans a game, and we've been doing that for a couple of years. You we can have make a, a joke about the A's there. <laughs> Averaging 9,000 a game? Earthquakes, yeah. A's? <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. We're 90%, we're, we're so. <laughs> but in terms of the future, I think with the population changing, I'm sure everyone saw the census and other demographics in the Bay Area or the United States. You have, you know, a more international population. A lot of people grew up in countries where association football was the primary sport, and a lot of those people live here in the Bay Area. So I think over time, those folks will congregate towards football, towards the earthquakes, and also towards our other businesses, which is promoting international events, whether it's Barcelona, which we brought here to play a candlestick, or um, Tottenham Hotspur, who came last year to play the quakes. So we do a lot of other things to just sort of corner the market on soccer here in the San Francisco Bay Area. As far as the A's question go, I mean, they're our sister organization. We basically share the same ownership. 
but the two organizations are pretty separate. Um, they were a little, before I came in as president eight months ago, they were a little more connected, um, but I came on and my sole focus is to run the Quakes um, standalone. So. But technically, uh, Lou Wolf and, and Mr. Fisher own both clubs, correct? Yeah, they do. Yeah, in the same way that like Stan Kroenke owns multiple clubs in, um, you know, uh, Colorado. So like there are a lot of MLS ownership groups that also have other professional sports teams is pretty common. Or for example, aren't some English Premier League teams owned by American sports owners, correct? Yeah, the Kroenke, who I just mentioned, owns Arsenal right. too. He Arsenal. just made, he, he has a majority stake now. And the, the Reds, there's a link between the Red Sox and... Yeah, the Red Sox ownership have Liverpool, Liverpool. which is another one of the story teams in the English Premier League. And the, uh, is there a link between the Yankees and Manchester United somewhere? Tampa I, Bay. Yeah, the, the Glazer, Glazer yeah, family. Glazer. Exactly. So the Buccaneers yeah. and yep. Manchester United. Yeah. So wow, a lot of this. A lot of connections. So Jed, are you going to buy a soccer team? <laughs> <laughs> at, at some point, maybe. Whoa, okay. All right. Could be. You're not kidding. I, I think there's there's a lot that we can do, and, and I certainly think you know developing a better partnership with the Earthquakes, you know, with a smaller stadium yeah. in San Jose, you, know, you can get 60,000, 70,000 people when you do play in Manchester United yeah. or you bring a Tottenham over and you do things like that where the MLS might not have that same type of draw for a large event. So with, with two stadiums next to each other in Santa Clara and San Jose, there, there's a lot of things that you can do together to bring some of the larger international games. And I think there are a lot of partnerships that in, we can your, work on together. Your, okay, I got you. Yeah, it's, hard, it's hard for us to bring, like Man U, their fee, or even Barca, it's very hard to bring them here without a stadium that's state of the art in 60 or 70,000 right. seats. And so that new facility that the Niners are building is, is the key thing for us in, in that in that regard and before I, okay, it's great stuff and uh, I want to ask Craig another question about America's Cup but Larry are you guys gonna buy a soccer team I'm not so sure soccer um, we'll leave that to Jed but we've looked at some other teams in other sports that are you know possibly winter sports, winter sports. late fall winter <laughs> sports I, it, 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 and we've looked at some other some other ventures. I mean, there's no secret it was reported. I mean, we looked at the Warriors right. in the sense that we're, we're partners with them. We we are um, own a third of Comcast Sportsnet, and the Warriors have a uh, now a new 25 year deal with Comcast Sportsnet. So we have a lot of linkage, I think, with with that franchise, and uh, we see ourselves in the sports and entertainment business. I think there, it's it's possible that we could buy an entertainment entity. Uh, the Red Sox have, have, have done that, that maybe even outside of sports that could play in an arena or in, a, in our ballpark. Right, so we'll have to ask you again about the possibility of an arena being built across the left field dual bridge. But I wanted to get back, circle back now to Craig Thompson, the CEO of America's Cup 2013. We opened with the video. And again, we've talked about established franchises. Now you guys, to make this clear, this is sort of a one and, is the phrase one and done? I mean, after the 2013 America's Cup, it would go to a new venue. So this is really the Bay Area's only chance to see the America's Cup? Not necessarily. Um, and by the way, I think we're going to buy a soccer team. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> soccer on water. <laughs> yes. I've, I've been in Europe for a long time, and, and the soccer is so strong there that all the major sports combined don't have as many fans as just soccer does. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's really an incredible phenomenon. So I think big growth potential here. Yes. But um, <clears throat> uh, no, if, if, um, it depends on who wins. It's a very unusual sport. Uh, the winner of the cup has the right to organize the next cup and also to take it to the venue of their choice. So recently, the Swiss had won the America's Cup, which is rather unusual, not having any oceans on their borders. <laughs> But um, they made a great challenge, and they, they won the cup, and they decided to hold it in Valencia, Spain. So if, if Larry would uh, win the cup again, the Oracle Racing Team, then um, probably they will stay here in San Francisco. Okay, so a chance to have it more than once. Uh, I was talking to your people yesterday preparing here, and I just say you guys have technology that can help the viewing process, right? I heard about you guys have signed. For example, remember when the yellow line, the first down line came? and. We all kind of freaked out about it. Well, what is that thing? You know, Danielle, like, so, so Danielle didn't really start watching football. This is his lovely and, girlfriend. And she doesn't know watching football pre-yellow line. <laughs> so, so we're watching games on the NFL Network. <laughs> and she's just like, well, how do you know we're the first? <laughs> <laughs> how do they know? It's and the it's new just, generation. Yeah. The new generation. Well, you guys have well, this kind of stuff that can help the TV viewing. I heard you guys signed on with a new company, right, that some sort of technology that helps the viewing process? Well, actually, it's the same individual that was responsible for the yellow line in American really? football. Yeah. We have a big problem in sailing because, you know, one boat's going that way and another boat's going that way, and who's <laughs> ahead? Mm -hmm. So we've, um, we're doing a blue line, 
Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to make it very easy for people to see exactly what the position of the votes is. Right, that will help. Mm. You know, because I think there's going to be interest, but there's going to be a lack of knowledge, almost like soccer in a way. There is that hardcore group that knows soccer and that hardcore group that knows sailing, but there's going to be casual sports fans like all of us who are going to be interested in it. So are you ready to give us the, you know, America's Cup for dummies in the next two years kind of thing? Well, you know, there's a, there's a, surprisingly, there's a, there's a large number of sailors in America, but we obviously have to get those sport fans that are watching the Giants and the 49ers and the Earthquakes. We've got to get them participating also. So part of our job is to explain and get people to understand sailing to to bring out the personalities behind these boats and the rivalries and the, you know, explain exactly what it is to, to make the decision to turn the boat this way or that way under these enormous pressures and all the wind conditions. It's a very exciting sport and we're going to have the cameras on the boat. So instead of watching it from a distance, you know, we have, we have a live camera on every boat with a cameraman and five HD uh, fixed cameras. So it's really what we call sailing from the inside out, which will with the sounds that we have, and, and it, it makes you feel like you're on the boat, really participating. And, and, what's and these the boats are so fast that it's um, the, the feeling of being on the boat, uh, going 30, 35 knots on the water, it's really exhilarating. You can see that in that video. Uh, what's the TV situation, the TV deal? Uh, how will we be able to watch it? Well, we're, we started all this in January, so right now we're in the middle of discussions with broadcasters all over the world. We'll do country by country um, arrangements, and that's all in process right okay, now. So, so we're very hopeful to have a network deal here in America. Um, it's a big deal that the Cubs come back now, and we think we'll get a network deal. I have some questions to get to for everybody. This is fun. Thank you guys for these. Just, but real quick, since nobody from the Warriors is here, so we can talk frankly, and since you work with Larry Ellison, <laughs> <laughs> so how mad was he that he didn't get the Warriors, and uh, is he going to take it out on the, on the yachting competition, you know? Well, you know, he bought Indian Wells tennis tournament, so I think, I think he's <laughs> yeah. fine. Consolation prize, huh? Have you guys dealt with Larry much, Larry or Jed or Gary? Yeah. Any of you dealt with Larry Ellison? We, we have. Big sports yeah. fan who is around and tried to buy the Warriors? I dealt with Joe Lacob, actually. I, I used to run a uh, women's professional basketball league, uh, which was uh, put out of business by the NBA. But uh, Joe Lacob was one of our investors in the ABL. Um, brilliant guy, uh, really fair guy. I think uh, if they give him a little bit of time, some of the columnists are already saying, you know, what have you done for us lately after two months? But uh, I think Joe Lake will do a job with the Warriors. Well, we, we've talked about, you know, sort of our new stadium being like the Coliseum, where you can flood it and do a boat race there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. We have a lot of questions to get to, so I'm just going to kind of open Great it up idea. to you. General, yeah, see? <laughs> the things you learn at the Bay Area <laughs> Council <laughs> Outlook. Uh, this one straight away, uh, America's Cup, right off of you, Craig. Um, a question comes in, does the America's Cup have a plan to engage youth in sailing? That's interesting to get the, uh, the future Larry Ellison's out there. Well, coming from the soccer background where every boy and girl all over the world that play soccer from five years old are registered in a club and you know, are part of an organization, one of our first questions to America's Cup organizers was, uh, could we see the database of all the, all the yacht clubs and you know, how do the young people get into sailing? And there, there hasn't really been a pathway for young sailors into the America's Cup, so that's one of the things um, and, and, and Larry Ellison has really been supportive of this. He knows that for the sport to grow and, and to prosper in the future, we've got to get the young people excited. So these really fast uh, boats is a big part of that. But also, we're going to make a smaller replica of the big boat and set, be uh, offering that to, to young people at a, at a very inexpensive price to get kids sailing catamarans, which are going to be a lot of fun for them, and creating a whole pathway for children uh, to get into sailing, uh, to compete, and even to, if they reach a certain level, come out to some of our events and get some exposure with the, with, the, with the older athletes and at those races. So it's a whole pathway now to get youth into sailing. Very good. Okay, we have 15 minutes left, so we'll, we'll, I'll try to get through as many of these and just respectfully asking, I guess we have to keep our answers on the shorter side so we can get all these in, although I'm enjoying hearing you guys talk. Uh, for David, is there enough room for soccer to be a big five sport in the USA? I think so, and I think if you look, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, we produced a game at the Oakland Coliseum between the Mexican national team and Paraguay, and we had 50,000 people there. We sold it out six weeks ahead of time. It was a great event. We even had rain, but everybody showed up. It was fabulous. And I think the most telling thing about that event was that the Chronicle didn't even write an article the next day about it. <laughs> and I, and I, but I think it's happening, but the mainstream media isn't necessarily picking it up. And so I think we're actually at a higher level than people think. And I think just over time, we will get there. Uh, yeah, again, a lot of growth there. Gary, here's a hot potato for you. Should college athletes be paid? 
you run a college football bowl game. This is a very hot topic. And I guess some would say at Auburn University, they already are. Right? Yeah. But just a joke about Auburn. I'm sure all the colleges have <laughs> handshakes going on. Well, that's Except a great, for Notre Dame. That's a great question. And there's a lot of lawsuits that have been filed on this subject. And, uh, uh, you know, the NCAA and its infinite wisdom is extremely hypocritical. I mean, you know, that w when you have a scholarship, if you're a student who has a full ride, let's use Stanford as an example, you don't only get your tuition, your room and board, but you get expense money. An athlete gets no expense money. So he has no money to do his laundry or put gas in his car. So at the very least, they ought to get expense money. But when you consider that these coaches are being paid three and four million dollars and the athletes that are generating the revenue don't get a dime, it seems a little hypocritical. But the NCAA, you mentioned Auburn, uh, last week was amazing, a couple weeks ago. Here's Cam Newton, his father is shopping him. They've admitted this, you know, for $180,000. There's a young man at Baylor, a basketball player, whose mother has a heart problem, and uh, she had to miss work. She borrowed $1,500 from his coach, repaid him the instant she got her paycheck, and they suspended the young man from the NCAA tournament. So it, it makes it makes no sense. So yes, I think they should be paid. I'm not sure what the form should be. I agree too. I, agree. I had a buddy at Notre Dame played football. My parents could not take him out to dinner when they came up. Wow. Just because of our affiliation with the team and him being on Notre Dame, and it's like, yeah. you know, I don't I don't think a, a steak once once a semester yeah. is is going to sway this kid to stay at Notre I'm Dame. With you. It's very archaic, and there's so many problems there. And Jed, while you're hot, here's one for you, and. You've been asked this a million times, but you're going to be asked it on April 12th, 2011. Have you ruled out staying in San Francisco? Did you write that question? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my writing. You know, we're, we're moving forward with Santa Clara. We, we obviously have an open mind to alternatives if Santa Clara doesn't work out, but we feel very confident that we're moving forward. And, you know, again, we've been trying to build a stadium since 1997. We, we don't want to end up like I saw the Cleveland Browns where they, they only focused on one location and then they ran out of time and they left. I want to make sure that the San Francisco 49ers stay in the Bay Area, remain the San Francisco 49ers, and when we win our next Super Bowl, you know, I want to have our parade right here on Market Street. We're the San Francisco 49ers. Well, then I'll throw you this one. Uh, Amy Trask listens to our radio show. We converse with her a lot and she's great. A shared stadium while emotionally distasteful for Niner fans or Raider fans would seem to make a lot of financial sense. It, it, what it would does. a shared stadium it, it look like? It does make a lot of financial sense. We've actually tied that into our, our, our term sheet and, and the deal that was voted on by the voters of Santa Clara. We haven't had a lot of detailed discussions. The Raiders are obviously focusing on, on something in Oakland. But that option is certainly available to us, and it's something that we'll continue to explore. And would you guys be prepared to handle, it would be obviously, while it financially it would make sense, and I'm sure in the future it would probably be best for the Bay Area, but there would be an amazing PR and, and, and uh, loyalty fallout from that. Have you guys, is that even, is that, you don't you know, even that, ponder that. It's certainly something that you think about, but when you look at 49ers and Raiders fans, and you can stereotype either one, which I'm, I'm not a big fan Go of. Go ahead. You know, no, I, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. I think the Raiders fans, you know, they, they do have a, a, a bad stereotype, which isn't fair to them. But when you look at sharing a stadium, you're not putting 49ers fans and Raiders fans in the same stadium for the same game. You know, you're, you're sharing a stadium that, again, it, there's not a lot of public money in California. That's right. You know, if there's not a lot of money in public, a lot of public money in California, and you're looking to keep prices more affordable for families, you're looking to keep it not sort of the NASCAR approach. We're going to put a sticker on everything and sell it. You know, you want to have something that's more of a traditional down-home football game. I, I think sharing a stadium 10 days a year is is feasible. I agree. Uh, here we go for Larry and for Jed. Football and baseball have gone through an era of expansion. However, is some contraction ahead is the question. Now, we've heard that for the NBA, perhaps. I'm just going to editorialize and say I wouldn't think the NFL would be on that road. Is baseball or is NFL, is this all part of a possible future? Well, the facts are the collective bargaining agreement that we're living under now that expires actually for baseball at the end of this year allows, for the last two years of the agreement, allows contraction uh, if there is a reasonable cause to discuss it. So it could be an, an uh, effort uh, in the league 
to reduce by, you can't reduce by one team, so it would have to be a minimum of two teams. I think it's a, it's a real long shot, and it's something that is not actively being discussed. Um, you know, you get a situation where taking a team from a community is, uh, you know, is ripping the heart out of that community. It almost happened with the Giants multiple times. It almost happened in 92 when our group came in. It almost happened in 76 when Bob Lurie saved the team. So I think baseball will go to all lengths possible to avoid taking team to literally evaporating one or two. It would have to be two teams. So I think it would be a, a, a last resort. NFL, no, none chance of contraction? No, and, and I think you'll see most likely a team move to LA as opposed to a new franchise start. And one of the reasons why people talk about contraction in the NFL is, well, the, the talent isn't there like it used to be. You don't have the same number of quarterbacks. I don't think the NFL or college sports are doing a good enough job training kids. We had a coach from East LA College, East LA Community College. They've got three kids that are draft eligible that are, are we have draft grades on that will most likely get drafted. They're transferred out to Utah and I think two other schools that I'm blanking on right now. If we can spend more time with those types of coaches and develop one more player per team, that's one more kid per round that's more draft eligible, that's ready to play. You just, you need to put some work into it if you want to develop kids and, and have a better talent pool. Okay, uh, a couple more here with seven minutes left. Larry Bear, is baseball revenue sharing working? Secondary question, should teams that receive money, the lower payroll teams, be mandated to put it back into their payroll? Good question. <laughs> Uh, no. So just the, the quick background on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. About $430 million is being transferred from payor teams to payee teams to try to equalize the, the, the balance, the competitive balance in, in baseball. Uh, we are a payor. We will pay to the tune of 25 to $30 million a year into a, into a fund where teams will use it to, uh, the teams that are payee teams and they're approximately I think about 11 payee teams and, and about uh, 12 or 13 payor teams and everybody else is sort of a, uh, in a neutral position. Um, you know, revenue sharing, I think, has had a, a purpose and a function. If you look through baseball, uh, no team, and I don't I want this to be a bad jinx for us, no team has won a back-to-back -back World Series since uh, the Yankees in the late 90s. So, so you do see, other, you see new teams coming in every year and in part that, uh, is facilitated by revenue sharing. So I think it's a good thing. There are going to be teams that will say no more of this good thing. In other words, don't increase revenue sharing in the next deal. And that'll be discussed. My, my sense is that revenue sharing will continue, needs to continue, and, um, and is probably overall a good thing for, for the sport. In terms of payee teams, it's a lot of discussion about the fact that they shouldn't take the money and, and put it in their pockets. They should spend it on their operations. There's been some discussion and dispute over whether they do or they don't. And, uh, and obviously, I, they should put the, the money they receive into their, into their operations, into their baseball operation. Uh, this one, Jed, you thought that I wrote the other one. I think you wrote this one. Uh, is it possible for a professional sports team to be successful today without a world-class stadium? Uh -huh. Put it on a tee for you there, Jed. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it definitely helps. Um, but there's, it's not like we're saying, well, we're not going to try to win a Super Bowl until we build a new stadium. And I, I think you're going to see us absolutely perform to the level that I expect with Jim Harbaugh as our head coach. And I think it's going to be very exciting. I, I think we don't celebrate Candlestick enough, hopefully with a finite life on Candlestick. We understand that, yeah, it's old. You know, they're, they're, it's not the, the greatest, newest stadium like going to AT&T. But we can celebrate the history of Candlestick over the next couple years. And I think with the fans, with what we are starting to put together with Coach Harbaugh, I mean, we are going to absolutely compete for Super Bowls and, and hopefully win some Super Bowls before we get into our new stadium. So yes, but not mutually exclusive. <laughs> All right. Uh, we just have four minutes left, so we'll wrap up by just kind of saying, you know, given that the theme of this, and by the way, I want to mention the Giants were generous enough to bring a, uh, a Mark DeRosa autographed bat 
that's uh, unused, I would imagine, given his playing time. Late. <laughs> now, come on. <laughs> I'm a DeRosa fan. Get your home oh. phone number. Wow. I'm a DeRosa fan. I'd like to see him out the there. The next time you ask him to be on your show. No, no, I, wa home I want it to He'll be out there. That. I want him to be out there. <laughs> I, that's for my friend Bruce Bochy. Play him. And four field club tickets with field visit to an upcoming game. And that's all out in our little um, exhibit area. If you drop your business card off, you can win one of those two prizes. So thanks to the Giants for bringing that. Um, you see, that's very nice, yes. Um, you know, about 30 seconds, 40 seconds each. Um, given that it is the future, David, what is the kind of the one thing you want to accomplish in the very near future for the earthquakes that'll, that, that would make you happy within the next year? Um, well, I think a couple things. You know, one, obviously, is to continue to make progress on our stadium down in San Jose. We have a 17,000 seat facility that we're in the process of building right by um, the International Airport there. So I think that's really our number one focus. And then secondly, is to win a championship. And we have a very good team this year. We have a great player, Simon Dawkins, on loan from Tottenham Hotspur. We have a local kid, Chris Wondolowski. He had 18 goals last year, won the Golden Boot. He's from Danville. So there's a lot of good stories, and, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. You guys got a shot at it? Oh, definitely. We were Final Four last year. Right. So, yeah. That's correct. You were. Okay. Well, thanks, David. Uh, Craig, uh, what would it be? I know it's two years away, but what would you guys need to get done in the next year that would make you happy about the immediate future? Well, our, our next big objective is uh, opening the America's Cup Academy, a sailing academy down by the wharf. And um, we want to have that open in July this year with uh, some of our catamarans and some monohulls that have been in the previous America's Cups and get people coming to participate in sailing. Uh, from all over the world uh, and have that America's Cup experience, and that's that's a big objective of ours. So that would be down by the wharf in the next year? That's in July. Oh, in July this yeah. year. Okay, great. I'll take, can I take my little three-year-old? You're welcome. All right, that'll be fun. Uh, Gary, you know, I love college football. What, what do you need to see done in the next year to make you happy about the future and the present of the Emerald, of the Emerald Bowl, the Craft Bite Hunger Bowl? Well, it's kind of a two-pronged thing, I think, Brian. We want to continue to grow the game, which means on the football side, uh, get better teams. You know, we want to continue to improve the quality of our teams. We'd like to move up in the Pac-10 pecking order a little bit. On the other side, for the next three years, we have Army, Navy, and BYU, so we feel pretty good about our matchup, but we'd like to continue to build it. And on the other side, we'd like to continue to give back to the community and build on what we started with Glide and St. Anthony's and the food bank. That is cool. And, and can you guys move up the Pac-10 pecking order? Is that a negotiation or is that a... It's all about money. Okay. It's all about money. The more you pay, the higher you pick. And are you glad I didn't ask you questions about your socialization with the Fiesta Bowl director? Yes, thank at all? you. All right. <laughs> Let me know that story, the Fiesta Bowl guy. Wow. If you don't, look, Google it, all right? Uh, Jed, it's pretty, uh, your answer should be pretty easy, huh? Just, and but, the lockout, or what, is, what needs to well, get done I mean, in the we, next we, year? And? We need, to, we need to negotiate a deal with the Players Association. I mean, that's, that's an NFL level thing, but the future of sports in the Bay Area, I mean, it's, you know, re-engaging the fans throughout the entire Bay Area with our head coach, you know, with a new stadium and, and getting the team back to where I expect them to be. And if the team is what I expect them to be, I, I promise you everybody's going to be happy. You know, everybody says, that, and I love the Giants, I also love the Niners, but everybody says it's a baseball town now, it's a baseball town, and I love that, I love baseball. But you just watch the 49ers get back to the playoffs, and we'll see if it's a baseball town. Well, <laughs> All right. well my alma mater is now a, a women's basketball and soccer school. Well, so. yeah, see, this is how this mighty have fallen. I think there's room for the late 80s glory days when the Giants and the Niners were both awesome. That's what I'm looking for. And Larry, uh, the future, I mean, it's, it's, to be honest, you know me. I'm so affiliated with the Giants. I wrote a book on, two books on you guys. And, are book signing books tonight available at the stadium, outside? by the way. Yeah. Are there books out there? <laughs> signing tonight at the yard, 5.30 to yeah. 7. If you guys are going to be, come on by and see my photographer friend, Brad Mangin. In some ways, even as a fan, it's hard to look at the future because so much has been accomplished and satisfied, and there's such a happy glow. How do you engage the future? Well, I think that you know, baseball, uniquely, Brian, I think is a generational sport, and I think we need to continue to elevate really the community and generational experience at the ballpark. You know, I grew up going to games with my father. People go to games with their grandparents, with their grandchildren. And to be able to continue to offer this as a, a community resource, it's really what we do in our summers and spring, it's kind of our second homes, if you will, is going to the ballpark. And I say this really fresh in my mind, what happened last night, mm -hmm. where we had a, a, a pre-game 
uh, very unique, unprecedented in baseball and sort of traditionally not done where the teams came together on the field in the wake of the, the tragic uh, uh, occurrence in Los Angeles uh, about a week and a half ago. And they basically said that, look, we have a great rivalry, Giants and Dodgers. We go like hell on the field at each other. Off the field, this is an opportunity for the national pastime to make a statement that we're in this together and that we promote these ballparks as being safe havens for families. And I think that our ballpark in 11 years has, has been that and to do everything we can to perpetuate that. Winning, you know, I got 10 fingers, so winning <laughs> lots of rings would be wonderful. But, but you know, what's really important in what we do, I think in, in, in many ways in sports is bringing uh, experiences to people. And I think that that's what we want to continue to do. Agreed. My last question was going to be an easy one. How awesome are Tim Lincecum and Buster Posey? But I think we all know the answer to that one, right? Lincecum tonight at the yard. So thanks to everybody. Larry Bear, Jed York, Gary Cavalli, Craig Thompson, David Cavall. The future of Barrier Sports is in their hands and your hands. And thanks for coming. Thank Barry, you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.